Well, Thursday is Thanksgiving, and, uh, and we're excited about that. I believe that the, the Lord has given my wife a word for today. So we're going to let Sherry come and share her heart with us today uh, as we continue to worship with the word. Would you welcome Sherry? Why don't we pray over you? Okay. That'd be okay? Yes. I'll Father, pray. I thank you so much for my wife. Lord, this has been a hard week. And uh, I know, Lord, that you have uh, prepared her heart, God, that you've given her a word, Lord, for today. And I ask, Lord, that you would speak it, that our hearts would be open uh, to you, uh, Lord, and that you would change us from the inside out. We love you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I am very excited about today. It's uh, I, last week, Pastor James closed out the called out series. And next week we start our MOSS series, MOSS M-A-S, uh, with like two dots over the A or something like that. But uh, we're very excited about that. And I guess during, uh, during the schedule, you know, Pastor Kevin, he was looking over the schedule and he's like, oh, okay, we just ended called out and we have moss coming up, but it's not quite Christmas. And we just have this week, this week right before Thanksgiving. What should the topic be? I mean, what should we talk about for Thanksgiving? Oh, I know. Let's talk about Thanksgiving. So today I'm talking about Thanksgiving. (laughs) So I'm very excited. But one reason why I'm so excited is because earlier this year, I got the privilege of being able to speak during our simple series. And when we were going through Colossians and a verse that I was given in the passage that I was going to be speaking on, there was one verse, actually just a part of a verse that stood out to me. And uh, I I wanted to show it to Kevin because what stood out was that it didn't stand out. And that's what surprised me. It's like I just read right over. And in fact, I gave it to you. I gave it to Kevin. I was like, Kevin, read this verse. And so he reads the verse and then he stops right before the sentence that I wanted him to read. I was like, no, you didn't read the whole thing. You got to keep going. Because he was expecting me to say something about like, you know, that big beefy sentence that was at the beginning of the verse. But I just want to point out the small, tiny sentence at the end of that verse, which was, and be thankful and be thankful. And it's something that we just completely pass over. But when I looked over, when I looked into that that phrase and I I dug into uh, the Greek meaning of each of the words and the idioms and all this different stuff, I I found that it it seemed that the word could be interpreted, that that sentence could be interpreted, mind your favor. Because God has his favor over us in so many different ways. And we just need to be mindful of it. And so all year since I've spoken, uh, it was that January or February, I think it was February, uh, a whole year I've gotten to dwell on thankfulness and minding your favor and being grateful. And so it, it's, been, <laughs> it's been a good year. It's been, uh, it's been fun working on this message. And so I want, to, I want to share this with you. Now, normally we uh, stand up and read scripture together, but since you guys are home, I'm just gonna read it to you. <laughs> so today I am reading from two different passages. It's Psalms. 107 verses one through nine. And then I'm also going to read from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. So starting in Psalms 107, it starts out, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south, Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Then also 1 Thessalonians 5. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's living and active today. Thank you that we can dive into the word and it just, its depths are endless, God, and that that you can teach us so much from these things. I pray that you... I pray that you use me today, God. Any, any words or any thoughts that are on my own, I pray that you just cast them aside. But the things that you want me to say, the things that, is your, that are your messages, God, I pray that that is what is spoken. And that as a body of believers, that we can become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, that we can, 
that we can embody who he was more and more. And that had through talking about Thanksgiving today, God, that we can grow closer to that image and together as a body, bless you with our Thanksgiving. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's, as Christians, we are very, uh, almost obsessed a little bit with God's will. It's like, what is God's will for my life? God, what do you want from me? What, what is your will? Like, should I take this job or should I take this job? Should I go that way? Should I go this way? Should I marry this girl or that girl? And like, hopefully that's not what any of those guys are saying. Hopefully you know who you should marry. But anyways, we all are always asking, what is God's will for my life? And it's so funny because literally, Right in scripture, it's written. Let me read it again. Rejoice always, break continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So what is God's will? In, at all times, in all circumstances, always rejoice, pray, and give thanks. That's God's will. I'm remind, I, it's funny because uh, a, a lot of times we, we say like, God, which way should I go? What, when, what is your will? Should I go this way or should I go this way? And guess what? A lot of times it doesn't matter because our infinite, all-knowing, all-powerful God has a plan for you if you go right. And he has a plan for you if you go left. And it doesn't matter whether you choose right or left, but what matters is that when you make that choice, that during the good times and definitely during the bad times, because there are bad times, because we're in a fallen world. So the Bible actually guarantees you when you face trouble, because there will be trouble in this world. When you face that trouble and during the good times, during both of those, you at all times rejoice, pray and give thanks. And that's his will. It's not necessarily the decision. It's not necessarily where you're going or what you're doing. It's what's on the inside and what you're doing through that fruit of the spirit. I'm reminded what Justin said. Pastor Justin uh, did a series called Words, Words, Words uh, a few weeks ago. And he said, uh, he said during that, that, the, that Thanksgiving is what enters you into the presence of God. And he gets that from the verse, where, the verse that says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. And it just, it, the way that he worded that was very interesting to me. Because like, if thanksgiving enters you into the presence of God, but if I'm praying without thanksgiving, what is that doing? Like, it, it just made me kind of think and ponder. And, I, I, and honestly, honestly, it reminds me of breakfast. Um, breakfast with my kids now as uh, adults that get to make our own choices. And as cereal lovers, Kevin and I buy all the bad cereals and we get to, we let our kids choose whichever cereal they want. And so they each have their favorite cereal. And so every morning, usually every single morning, occasionally we switch it up, but most mornings we grab their favorite cereal at the pantry and we pour them a bowl and we say, here's your breakfast. And it's, it's a delightful time until about 10 minutes later, Ruby for sure, Ruby guaranteed, 10 minutes later would be like, mommy, I'm hungry. I was like, you literally just ate breakfast. And she's like, yeah, but I'm hungry. I'm like, you're not hungry, but I am. And I'm like, okay, well, we have to get ready for school. So it's not snack time yet. You just go get ready. And, but I'm also reminded that at every single one of those boxes, every single brand, when you watch their commercials on TV, what is the phrase that they say at the end of the commercial? part of a complete breakfast. And it has the the cereal box and it has the bowl of cereal and two pieces of toast and it has orange juice and it has milk and it has an egg and it has yogurt. And it's saying that the cereal is part of a complete breakfast. And yet I'm taking the bowl of cereal and saying, here's your breakfast. And I'm wondering why they're hungry in 20 minutes. My question is if God's will for us is to rejoice, pray, and give thanks, we tend to gravitate towards one, maybe even two of those, but we rarely get all three of those incorporated into our life at all times. And yet we wonder why we are left spiritually hungry and feeling unfulfilled. There's there's a story from LCA long, long time ago, long time ago, Keith and Sherry Lancaster wanted to bless the teachers. So what they did 
was they decide, let's buy them pizza on Friday. So they bought them pizza on Friday. The teacher's like, yeah, this is awesome. Like, well, we just wanted to thank you for all of your hard work. You're doing such a great job. And so this is just a small gesture for you. And so they, they, the teachers were so grateful that they continued to give them pizza every Friday. And it was, it was such a blessing. You know, they, they got the pizza every single Friday. Well, then later in that year, uh, there were some... Uh, tightening of the budget, and they had to cut back in certain areas. So what's an easy thing to cut back on is like, well, we just can't afford to buy the teacher's pizza on Fridays right now. And so they, they didn't buy the pizza. And so the teachers walk in and they're like, where's the pizza? Oh, well, there, there's no pizza this week. What? What? Are we not working hard enough for you? Are we not good enough? Like, what do you mean there's no pizza? What am I supposed to do for lunch? It's not like I have a wallet and a car and there's a restaurant down the street and I can just buy it for myself. Like, what am I supposed to do for lunch? And it's interesting because in that case, they became so used to the blessing that they became blind to the goodness that they were being given. And then they became, I guess, ingrateful in a lot of ways. Um, that, like I said, that was many years ago. <laughs> but I wonder how many of us are kind of like that today. We live in a fallen world, like I've said. We live in a fallen world. There's going to be trouble. And so let's say, let's say I'm dealing with a health issue. I'm dealing with a health issue. And I've been dealing with this for, let's say, three years. And I'm praying, God, please, like, God, this is just so difficult to deal with. And, and I don't understand what's going on. But please, just can you please just touch my body? Please just let everything be okay. Nothing seems wrong with that prayer, Right? except when you change the perspective and you say this prayer instead. God, thank you. Thank you for 30 years of good health. Thank you for three decades of good health that I was able to enjoy the life with barely any sickness, Lord. And I know that I'm dealing with something right now, but I also know that you are in control and that you are gonna help me. But God, thank you that you have given me so much so far. It's an interesting perspective. There's two ways to look at that. But at all times, to have that complete breakfast, pray. Re rejoice, pray, and give thanks. And when we incorporate those together, it builds a more powerful spiritual connection with God as well. And, and it's so funny because even Philippians 4, 6 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, remember that verse before that said at all times, always, in all circumstances, once again, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Thankfulness is something that has to be cultivated. When I said that I read over that verse and be thankful in Colossians, uh, the, another uh, thing about that word be, the word be is just so easy. But when I dug into the Greek of it, it said, you know, like it said, cultivate. That was another definition of be, cultivate. Now, if you're cultivating something, that means you're working at it. It's not like, heck, hey, look at this. It grew into a tree. It's like, no, it's like, like it takes time. It takes work. It takes effort. Cultivation takes, takes time. Thankfulness needs to be cultivated. It said cultivate thankfulness. It's something that we have to work at. It's something that we have to be mindful of so that we're constantly remembering we should be thankful. God has put so much favor in our lives that we need to be thankful. One of my favorite quotes is from the donut man. I don't know if any of you guys remember the donut man. He is a uh, children's a Christian personality from many years ago. If you remember the Donut Man, you're older than me. Sorry, because <laughs> he was that. He was before my time. But I found a quote of his, and it's been my favorite for many years. And he says, "When you go through life, make it your goal to look at the donut and never the whole. When you go through life, make it your goal to look at the donut and never the whole." See, the thing is that a lot of us as humans, we see all we. We regret and we get upset about all the things that are missing from our life, the dreams that are unfulfilled, uh, the house that we didn't get, the, the dream job, all these things that are missing that we, that we didn't get, that we wanted so bad. And yet we're missing the well-rounded, sweet life that God has given us. Because guess what? That donut was made with a circle in the middle. It's not something that's missing. It was never meant to be there. 
And so when we focus on those things, we miss all the stuff that God has for us. Theodore Roosevelt said, comparison is the thief of joy because comparison uh, either develops feelings of inferiority or superiority. And as human beings, neither one of those are great characteristics. Now, I wanna propose something else that is a, a main point that I want you guys to remember today is that comparison is the thief of joy, but perspective increases thankfulness. Perspective increases thankfulness. Now, let me describe this a little bit to you. Um, comparison, because comparison and perspective kind of get a little tangled with like what they mean. So I wanna, I wanna define it for you. Comparison is when you take two or more objects and you identify what is the same and what is different. For instance, this one is a smaller. This one is bigger. They're both white with red ribbon and a red bow. These ones are shorter than me. That one is taller than me. I am comparing. Perspective, perspective is taking one item and looking at it from a different angle. Or maybe even through a different lens. It's getting a well-rounded picture of what it is because you're looking at it from all sides and you're also discovering what its story is. That is perspective. And when we look at things, see a lot of times what we see is the world full of chaos and trouble. And that is true because we live in a fallen world, but we need to not just look at what's going on, we need to see. A verse was brought to mind a few weeks ago that I've been dwelling on and it's such a, it's one that most of us know. It's 1 Samuel 16, seven. And it says, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It's like God has x-ray vision, but like a thousand times cooler. Okay, so you have to imagine like, like we see the situation, we see a person, we see what they've done, but God sees past the situation. He sees into the person, he sees their heart, he sees their mind, he sees their motive. He sees, he sees not just the situation, but he sees the future of that situation and the past of that situation. And I want to invite us today to change our perspective to put, if, if we could just take that God lens and be able to look, it reminds me of, um, if you remember as kids, they have these red scribbles all over everything. And then we can take the red, the red filter and you put it over there, there's blue words underneath. Does anybody remember that? Some kids, the kids, LOLs have that. Uh, older kids and adults, we, have, uh, we had other games like that. It kind of reminds me of that where we see all the chaos but when we put the filter over it, we see the truth that's behind it. And that's what we need is we need that God filter, that God lens to be put on so that we don't just look, but we can see. The verse that I read at the beginning says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. So today, uh, that's what I wanna do. I wanna tell my story, give you a perspective that maybe you haven't seen before, but for this perspective, I'm gonna travel way back in time and I'm gonna start with my great-grandmother. Her name was Bessie. And if we could put that picture up, please. It'll be up there in a second. Her name was Bessie. Bessie is the lady down front and center. That is Bessie. And these are her kids. Alec uh, is my great grandfather up in the top left corner. Now, Bessie, her name when she was a kid was Bessie Boyko. And she was born in the Ukraine. And her parents, through a lot of effort, decided to leave the Ukraine. They had to leave everything. They only could take what they could carry. And they, they headed to the border. They, they barely got through there. They got up to some ships and her, her father uh, went to get on a ship, but because her mother had been bawling her eyes out so much because she had just left her home, all of her belongings, all of her friends, all of her family to go, their plan was to go to America, uh, that her eyes were red and swollen. So they're like, oh no, she can't get on. She has diseased eyes. And so 
he had to go pay for her on a first class ship. They were willing to take her. So she took some of their kids and he took some of their kids and they went on two separate boats, traveling to a land that they have never been to, speaking a language that's completely different because they only spoke Russian. They came over, they landed at two separate ports and before they left, they said, we will meet at this certain town in North Dakota. So they traveled across the ocean without each other and somehow (laughs) scrambled halfway across the country and met up in North Dakota. And they did meet in North Dakota. But if you, if you know anything about North Dakota, North Dakota is a very tough land to live in. It's, um, it can get negative 40 at times in the winter. It's, it's very rigid. And so now my family, Bessie and her family are there with basically nothing. They have, they have nothing except what they can carry. And, but what they did have is that they had a four-sided wagon uh, with the walls. And so what they did is they took that wagon and they turned it over and that's where they slept because that's the only shelter that they could find. And so they would sleep all huddled together in this upside down wagon and during the day try to find work. Well, Bessie at this time was about 10 years old and she was sent to live with a family uh, to live and work for them. And guys, this was not a good situation. <laughs> uh, she got paid very little, if anything, And at 10 years old, she was about 10 years old, what she had to do is wake up very, very early and go out to the fields and move all the heavy rocks out of the field so that it could be tilled. She had to clean the barn. She had to take care of the animals. She had to do all these things. Her socks would get so soaking wet when she went out to work that at nighttime, she'd go up to the attic where there was a small cot for her to sleep on and she would hang up her socks and by morning time, they'd be frozen solid. And yet she would have to take those socks and wiggle her feet back into them and go back out to work in the fields. The work was so rough and the situation was so tough that, and she, she endured lots of abuse in that situation that it left her, it left her crippled. Her, she had so much arthritis in her, in her arms and her hands that she, she could barely move them. She was in a lot of pain and she couldn't even raise them above her head as she, got, uh, as she continued in the years. Now, there was, one, there was one time that she decided to run away. She ran away from that house and she got far away and she found a house where she could stay and that family took care of her. They were loving. She helped them out and it was great, but then she was found out. And so they took her away and sent her back to that house where she incurred so much abuse and so much hardships. So at this time, she decided to try to run away again. She ran away, but this time she went to the train station and all the money that she was able to muster up, she paid for a one-way train ticket to get as far away from there as possible. And so she was able to pay enough to get to a, a town called Max, North Dakota. And she arrived there. And remember, she was born in the Ukraine. She only speaks Russian. She barely knows, she knows very, very little English. It's not like someone was teaching her English at that house. And she arrives in town. She goes to a restaurant. She says, please, please, will you hire me? Can I work for you? And, and they said, we really don't have a position. Go check with the hotels. And if not, come back. And so she went to the hotel. She couldn't understand anything that they were saying. Lost and confused, b- broken. She's crippled. She, there's so many different things that she's struggling with. She went back to the restaurant. They took pity on her and they said, we will hire you. There was a cot in the back of the restaurant. So she slept in the back of the restaurant. And during the day, she worked at the restaurant. And she was so thankful just to have shelter and just to be <laughs> secure away from the family that she had been with. There was a local butcher that, uh, that went to that restaurant occasionally and he ended up falling in love with Bessie and they got married. So that was, that was Alec up there. And they began to start a family of their own. Uh, Alice was born and then Peter and then Agnes and, and so on and so forth. And, and as they got older, uh, there, was, there was one time, I do wanna point out Alice because I'm gonna be talking to her. Alice is this one on the bottom left. That's Alice, that's their oldest. There, there came a time in... Uh, through the years, Alice was in high school. So their oldest was in high school. And uh, they, Alec and Bessie took a trip to Minot, which was the big town close by. So they went to that town, uh, but the weather ended up being a lot more frigid than what they had expected. And it was very cold. So one of the evenings when they were walking along the street, they saw a sign on the storefront window that said gospel music inside. And, and they turned to each other like, maybe we can just go inside to warm up just for a few minutes. And they asked, is it okay if we just 
just come in just for a few minutes, just to warm up. And they're like, yeah, come on in. So they came in and they listened to gospel music. But then after the gospel music was over, they heard something that they had never heard before. And it was the story about Jesus, about how Jesus loved, <laughs> talking to Bessie, that how much Jesus loved her and that he gave his life for her so that she could have eternal life. And that evening, Bessie has, has accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And from that moment, her life changed. She was overwhelmed with love and grace and she was so thankful for Jesus. Well, the next evening she convinced her husband, she said, we, we gotta go back, we gotta go back. So they went back that next day and they were talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and Bessie was like, whoa, wait, hold on. <laughs> Jesus came to the earth, okay? He loves me, even though all the mess that I've been in, okay? He gave his life for me so that I could have eternal life. He gave all of that to me, which is more than enough. And you're telling me he has more for me? He has more for me, the Holy Spirit? Like what? Her mind was blown and she was so excited. She got prayed over, she, she received a, a prayer language. And she, at this point, she is on fire for the Lord. And they're like, we gotta go back the next night. We gotta go back the next night. So the third night they arrived and that night they were talking about healing. And so she's like, oh, well, praise the Lord. This is, this is what I need too. Because remember, she was so crippled. She couldn't even use her hands and her arms couldn't raise above her head. And she got prayed over that night. And for the first time in years, she was able to raise her hand and thank Jesus for all he has done because he was so good to her. And, and Bessie lived to be 104 years old. I got to meet her when she was 102. And my dad said, uh, what my dad remembers uh, very specifically about her was that no matter how old she got, her hands looked as young as they did the day that they were healed. And they worked just as well as the day that they were healed. That's how perfectly God had healed her hands and her arms. And so they went home and Alice, remember she's in high school and she's a very popular girl in high school. So when they came home, she's like, Oh no, I want nothing to do with your Bible bumping Jesus craziness that's happening right now. Like that, like, I, I don't want any part of it. And so, uh, and they didn't press it. They, they just, you know, continued their relationship. But Bessie, remember she's from a foreign country. She had learned her alphabet at this point, but she couldn't read. And uh, she, so she would have Alec read the Bible to her, but Alec was working 105 hours a week on the farm. So he didn't have much time to read to her, but Alice did. And she would have Alice read the Bible. And so Alice started to um, hear scripture, even if she didn't believe it, she was hearing it. And as she was hearing it, there was one day that she was home alone. And when you're on the farm, what you do is you, you burn your garbage. That's, that's how you get rid of it. It's not like there's trash service in, you know, 1928 uh, in North Dakota. So you're going to burn all the garbage that, garbage that you have. And so she went out and she, she was uh, burning some garbage, but then something, something wrong happened and the prairie caught on fire. The prairie caught on fire and as the fire began to spread, now normally what you do is you get, you get wet cloths and you throw it over the fire to try to put it out. But no matter what her efforts she tried and whatever things she tried, the fire kept growing and it became out of control and she didn't know what to do. And it kept going further and further to where it was almost at the neighbor's house. And she is in so much distress that she falls down on her knees and says, Jesus, if you'd stop the fire, I will believe in you and the fire stopped. Now for you science people, it's like, oh yeah, like God sent the rain, right? God sent the rain and fizzled out. No, there was no rain. There's literally no explanation. The fire just stopped. And at that point, Alice turned her entire life around. She ended up going to uh, college in Canada and then a Bible Institute in Minneapolis. And she ended up becoming one of the first uh, women pastors in the Assemblies of God Church. And for decades, she led more and more people to Christ in Montana. <laughs> Over time, all of the kids believed in Christ. And it's amazing going to family reunions and hearing the stories, the amazing God stories that they have. My grandmother is Elaine. She is the cute dimpled one sitting next to her mother on the right-hand side. And as she grew up, she married a preacher. And, uh, and let, let me explain a little bit of what their life was like. Their life was, they, 
God would tell them, well, get in the car this morning. It's Sunday morning, get in the car. So they'd get in the car and they would travel down the road and they would get to, uh, they, they would get to a church and God would say, go ahead and get out. So they would get out and they'd go inside the church and there was chaos happening in the church because the pastor's wife had gone into labor and there was no one there to preach. And my grandfather's like, well, God sent me here. And he went up to the podium and he had preached to them because that's why God sent him there. He had a message already prepared. Now there's not much money in that. <laughs> so my family grew up very poor. My dad, my dad remembers uh, many times his meal that he was given was salting crackers in water or salting crackers in milk, which sounds absolutely disgusting. But I guess some other people that are around his age say it's amazing and I don't believe them. Uh, <laughs> but that's what they would eat because they didn't have anything. And there was one day that my grandmother just prayed. She's like, Lord, please, if you could just like, if only I could just feed my family a chicken, like if I could just give them a chicken, I would be so thankful. That evening, she opened up her door and a fully cooked chicken is sitting right there for her. God has always provided. He always showed favor. No matter how dire and distressed the situation is, no matter how poor and broken they were, God always showed up. That even showed up in my father's time. I know that I'm pushing my time limit. I'm gonna try to talk faster, but even in my dad's life, going down another generation, God showed up in miraculous ways. He, he was trying to go on a mission trip to Tahiti and there were so many roadblocks along the way. Well, he finally got, he was on his way to the airport and they pop a tire. They have no jack, they have no lug wrench. And the spare tire is lodged in such a way because there was like a, a trailer or something on the car that made the spare tire almost impossible to get out. And so he's, <laughs> he's standing, uh, he, they're just waiting. They're like, we don't know what to do. We're already late to the airport. Like, what, what are we gonna do? And this lady pulls up on the side of the road and she's like, I don't know why I just stopped. I feel like God just told me to stop. I never stop, but I did today. And it just so happened that as soon as she stopped, the spare tire came loose. And she had a jack in her car, so they were able to jack up the car. And she also happened to have the exact size lug wrench that they needed in order to replace the tire. God provided, and when they got to Tahiti, my dad was there and they're like, we can't do this job, this job is impossible. We need a bulldozer to do this. Guess what drove down the street three minutes later? It's a bulldozer. God made all those things possible. And even going down one more generation, I'm gonna talk about my sister. Worship team, you guys can come up. My sister, uh, now there's many unfulfilled dreams that my sister has, and, and it, it's hard dealing with those, those, uh, the, the struggle of feeling your purpose in life. But there was one time where she was given an amazing job and she just, she decided to take a trip to the beach. We live on the West Coast, uh, at Washington State. So it was only a couple hours away. And she, she decided to take a weekend just to praise God and thank him for what he has done. And so she was in a swimsuit, but she didn't want to get wet. You know, it's one of those beach trips where it's like, you want to enjoy the waves and the scenery and the sounds and, and God's goodness, but you don't want to actually get wet. Um, and so she's, she's standing in the water. It's about, calf, uh, about to her calves and she's worshiping the Lord. Specifically, I mean, what song do you sing when you're standing in the ocean, except oceans? And so she's singing the song Oceans. And I want to read to you the lyrics real quick. It says, you called me out upon the waters, the great unknown where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start now. So I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine. And as she is standing there in the ocean, singing this song, my sister is a music teacher. So yes, she is singing out loud, probably at the top of her lungs in the ocean with everybody else around. And she's singing this song and a mother cries out from the, the, the shore and says, um, can you help my daughter? She's just a little bit past you. She doesn't swim very well. Can you, can you go help her? And remember, she didn't want to get wet, but she's like, okay, I'll go help. And so she, she walks a little bit further 
grabs a hold of the girl, and before she knows it, the girl and her are sucked into a riptide. And before she knows it, she is 100 feet away from the shore, being sucked further and further out in the ocean. The waves are crashing down, and she has a girl clinging to her back that doesn't know how to swim. She is screaming out. She is barely keeping her eyes above the waves. And she remembers by a miracle that when you're in a riptide, you always swim sideways to get out of the current. And so she is swimming sideways, and she's crying out, Jesus! 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 And she's saying, it's okay. Jesus is going to get out of this. Jesus is going to get us out of this because he has never failed and he won't start now. And she was able to swim out the riptide and some men came and got them, got, got the girls and brought them to shore. But that night, my sister had a very tightness in her chest and she couldn't breathe. She was rushed to the hospital, which was an hour away. My family's about three hours away, so it took much time to get to her. She was experiencing a heart attack because of everything that had happened. After all was said and done, she ended up going back to the doctor after all of that. And the doctor said to her, everything is fine with your heart. Perhaps you didn't have a heart attack. Perhaps she didn't, but I think I know better because God shows up. And no matter how much these people had been feeling broken and lost, rejected, useless, empty, when we change our perspective and put on that God lens, we can see what it really was, that they are chosen, that they are loved, that they are accepted, that they have purpose and that they are alive. There are 45, over 45 references of give thanks Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. His, and other versions of it, like his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds to mankind. 45 references. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. He's good. And I understand generational curses, guys. The Bible talks about generational curses being to the third and fourth generation. I get that because on my mom's side, my, my grandfather was an alcoholic and he drank himself to death by the time my mom was 12 years old. And she was the oldest of four kids. And that did something to her. And although she, she follows Christ, there was, there was something that scarred her from having to grow up without her father, that knowing that her father chose alcohol over her. It was, it was a struggle that she dealt with. And guess what? Because of the struggles that she dealt with, I have struggles that I deal with because of the generation, because of the, the, the effects that my grandfather, the choices that my grandfather made. And yes, generation curses, yeah, they can go from three to four generations, but it says in the Bible that his love goes to a thousand generations. And it covers all of those generations of anything that's bad. And just so that you get a perspective of how much a thousand generations are, guys, I did the research. There has been less than 100 generations on earth so far from Adam till now, less than 100. Do you realize that that means, that means that we haven't even experienced a portion of what His love is. His love is 10 times more than what we have experienced so far. His goodness is soaking in your life and we just need to put on a God lens to actually see the favor that's all around us. Yes, there's bad stuff happening. Yes, there will always be bad stuff happening, but there is also good happening. And there's God's plans that are happening. And so this week, I challenge you to cultivate that thankfulness. Start to think about what to be thankful for, to change your prayers from being, (laughs) it says rejoice, pray and give thanks. It's not rejoice like, yes, I got an A. Not pray like, Lord, please help me. Not give thanks like, give thanks for all you have done. It's not like that, it's put them all together and reach God's will. It's like, God, thank you. Thank you that I got an A. Thank you that you reminded me all of the answers. Thank you that you gave me enough study time. Thank you, that way I'm rejoicing and I'm giving thanks and I'm praying. And that is God's will that you just incorporate that into your life and you cultivate that because that is when you're standing in God's will. Stop looking at the hole that's missing in your life that was never supposed to be there. Start looking at the donut. Start looking at where the good stuff is that God has given you. We're gonna sing a song that's very precious to me. It's the blessing. And the reason why this is so, such a special song to me is because there's words in here that says, may his favor be upon you to a thousand generations, to your children and their children and their children and their children. And I've seen it. My my great-grandmother 
to my grandmother, to my father, to my life, to my kids. For, I am a living testimony that God is good for all generations. And so I want you guys to stand. I want you to sing this song with all that you have and just know that God's goodness is soaking in your life. Just open your eyes to not just look at what's happening, but see what He's doing.